Good morning. It's morning for me still. Um, what a morning it's been to conversations on my Facebook page, on Cora, um, just all over the place um, about Buddhism, availability of Gohonzans on my websites and uh, questions about karma. I mean, they just they keep coming, but I'm always keen to apply a different point of view or or a different interpretation to everyone who asks. Everyone asks in a slightly different way. That's very energizing. And now, time to continue with the Lotus Lectures. So thank you for joining me. Truly appreciate it. Again, my name is Sylvain Chamberlain. Uh, I'm an ordained monk um, through the Nichiren School. Um, but I practice the entirety of Buddha's teachings as he exhorted. So. Uh, this is a Lotus Sutra school that I call Quantum Life Buddhism, uh, only because I want to identify what I'm doing here as uh, a, an, I want to say avid, but I'm a daily diligent student of all of the Buddha's teachings uh, with the elucid elucidation of all the scholarship of Buddhism so that I can take it upon myself to uh, transmit correctly the teachings of Buddha or Shakyamuni Buddha, but Buddhism in its entirety, um, so that I can use my particular skills to decode, if you will, uh, the many translations uh, to move, as Shakyamuni talked about in the Lankavatara Sutra, to move us from the words to the meaning, which is the preeminent practice of Buddhism, is to understand the meaning of the words, not so much the words themselves. And that can be difficult, because we're dealing with some very old uh, languages that have gone through a lot of different steps of translations, translations by people with their own varied agendas that they may not be aware of, but if you're raised in a, a Western country, you're going to have some deeply held Western views, uh, whether to the degree they're imposed on the translation or not, uh, those are, those can be argued, but uh, they certainly are present, and uh, I'm acutely aware of them. So I bring them up because I want you to understand the teaching, not the translation. Okay. So with that, we're going to enter onto the fourth chapter of the Lotus Sutra. Can't believe we're already here. Um, there are 28, so it's going to take a little while, a few videos, but we're not here to zip through it. We're here to understand it. So it takes what it takes. And uh, before we begin, as always, please join me in Daimoku Sancho so we can open up our mental channels, uh, both so that I can speak clearly. Maybe, <laughs> maybe I'm asking too much, uh, but certainly that we can, however I deliver it, understand clearly or at least spark that understanding. Namul Myo Horeng Kyo Namul Myo Horeng Kyo Namul Myo Horeng Kyo Thank you very much. Um Without further ado, let's get into it. I'm probably saying this too much, but this may be the first time, the first video you see. So, uh, the title in this translation of the Lotus Sutra, which it says is a contemporary uh, translation, obviously uh, that reminds us that... Uh, 
by contemporary, we're talking about from a Western author. Um, oh, I like this. Um, that we're going to get a lot of that Westernized cultural thinking. Uh, there's a danger in that, and I caution you many times now, uh, that that could obfuscate the deeper meaning of what uh, the sermon was about originally. So I'm going through, I could say great pains, but it's not a pain. It's it's just that I'm going through a lot of uh, dedicated uh, redress, trying to remove as much as possible that inappropriate filter. So, for instance, in this translation by an English scholar, the fourth chapter is interpreted as faith and understanding. Now, you've heard my rant on faith. That just doesn't belong in the Buddhist literature anywhere. Faith is a very Western word, and it means, it implies a gift from elsewhere, a, a helping hand from outside of yourself, somehow gaining something you don't already have. That's all implied in the word faith. You may disagree, but uh, that's a popular understanding in some form. Uh, what I find in old Asian literature is a discussion about a strong mind. Well, that's quite different than faith. A strong mind in Asian terms is a mind built on not intellect and heart. In other words, not emotion so much as a deeply a bodily felt um, truth, uh, something that is contained within, not from without. Now, uh, in uh, the late 1800s, let me give you a specific date here, just to be clear. Oh, I don't see. I didn't put it in here. This is a reprint, an ebook that I printed out of an old classic that went out of print that was a translation by H. Kern. Okay, this was in the late 1800s. So talk about westernized. But as true scholars are, uh, he tried to find a word that best defined the concept he was reading in these ancient scripts. And for chapter four, the title he came up with was Disposition. Now, how different does that feel that, 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 what association, what mental, what mindset do you make when you read disposition as opposed to faith and understanding that's that's uh the gift of gene reeves for you uh mr reeves you're doing a disservice but i'm going to read your translation anyway because it it will be westernized a little bit easier to understand perhaps um than h kern's Right. But I would suggest to you that you read this H. Kern translation. It's free. It's available online. Or you can get it printed off my bookstore. Uh, there'll be a charge for it because there's a cost to printing. Uh, and, and it might be a little extra to cover, you know, shipping and, and, uh, um, a couple of bucks for, uh, my school, which I truly would appreciate a little bit of support. Uh, if you can't though, uh, again, it's free online. It, the, the title, uh, this is straight from the online ebook. All right. Um, or as I said, I like to read a book, a book. I don't like to read on the computer. So, uh, I went through the trouble of formatting it, putting it together, cleaning it up and, and putting it in a, in a printed book form so that you could have an actual book to put on your shelf and refer to from time to time. I mark mine up. There's, you'll see in here, see the, there's areas where I've uh, 
highlighted certain passages that I, I want to refer to in talks or whatever. Disposition. I like that translation. In fact, you know what? Just for a break, let's read from this book. I'm going to read the fourth chapter from this book. Just, why not? You ready? Sorry for those of you who are reading along. You may have the other book that I've been reading from, and I'll get back to it. But just, you know, to give you a different sense, or to give you the same sense out of a different point of view of what's being discussed here. And don't worry, Papa Sylvain will be here <laughs> to, to keep us on the clear <laughs> and narrow. All right. As the Venerable Subhuti, the Venerable Mahakasyayana, and the Venerable Mahakasyayana, Kasyapa, and the Venerable Maha Madhagalyayana, maybe I should be reading out of the other book, but these are very direct translations. What Kern did is he didn't just, just translate, uh, the names, uh, the, uh, the, the surname, the proper names, of uh in, from the sanskrit uh into english words he used them straight away so it's a little harder to read but be that as may uh as the venerable sabuti and the rest of these uh people heard this law un, unheard of before and as from the mouth of the lord this is shakyamuni buddha they heard the future destiny of Shariputra to superior perfect enlightenment, and they were struck with wonder, amazement, and rapture. You can tell already that this is old English, right? Uh, but the story is still cohesive, isn't it? We just got through reading in the third chapter of Shariputra's uh, eventual Buddhahood uh, as defined by Shakyamuni. So the story's still there the the terms may be different but this the meaning is there right they instantly rose from their seats and went up in uh to the place where the lord was sitting after throwing their cloak over one shoulder fixing the right knee on the ground and lifting up their joined hands before the lord looking up to him their bodies bent bent down and inclined they addressed the lord in this strain Lord, we are old, aged, or aged, advanced in years, honored as seniors in the assemblage of monks. Worn out by old age, we fancy that we have attained nirvana. We make no efforts, O Lord, for supreme perfect enlightenment. Our force and exertion are inadequate to it. Though the Lord preaches the law and has long continued sitting in Though we have attended to that preaching of the law, yet, O Lord, as we have no long being, so long been sitting, and so long attended the Lord's service, our, our greater and minor members, as well as the joints and articulations, begin to ache. Hence, O Lord, we are unable, in spirit of the Lord's preaching, to realize the fact that all is vanity or void purposeless or causeless or unconditioned and unfixed we have conceived no longing after the buddha's laws the divisions of the buddha fields the sports or display of magical phenomena of the bodhisattvas or tathagatas for by having fled out of the triple world o lord we imagine having attained nirvana and we are dis decrepit from old age Hence, O Lord, though we have exhorted other bodhisattvas and instructed them in supreme perfect enlightenment, we have in doing so never conceived a single thought of longing. And just now, O Lord, we are hearing from the Lord that disciples also may be predestined to supreme perfect enlightenment. We are astonished and amazed and deem it a great gain, O Lord, that today on a sudden we have heard from the Lord a voice such as we never heard before. We have acquired a magnificent jewel, O Lord, in an incomparable jewel. 
we had not sought nor searched nor expected nor required so magnificent a jewel. It has become clear to us, O Lord, it has become clear to us, O Sugata. It is a case, O Lord, as if a certain man went away from his father and betook himself to some other place. He lives there in foreign parts for many years, twenty or thirty or forty or fifty. In course of time, the one, the father, becomes a great man. The other, the son, is poor. In seeking a livelihood for the sake of food and clothing, he roams in all directions and goes to some place, whereas his father removes to another country. The latter has much wealth, gold, corn, treasures, and granaries, possesses much wrought gold and uh, uh, silver, many gems, pearls, lapis lazuli, conch shells and stones, corals, gold and silver, many slaves, male and female servants for the menial work, and journeyman is rich in elephants, horses, carriages. Okay, this guy's wealthy. He keeps a large retinue has his money invested in great territories and does great things in business, money lending, agriculture, and commerce. In course of time, Lord, that poor man in quest of food and longing, roaming through villages, towns, boroughs, provinces, kingdoms, and royal capitals, reaches the place where his father, the owner of much wealth and gold treasures and granaries, is residing. Now the poor man's father, Lord, the owner of much wealth and gold, treasures and granaries, who had, was residing in that town, had always and ever been thinking of his son he had lost fifty years ago. But he gave no utterance to his thoughts before others, and was only pining in himself and thinking, I am old, aged, advanced in years, and possess abundance of bullion, gold, money, and corn, treasures, and granaries, but I have no son. It is to be feared lest death shall overtake me, and all this perish unused. Repeatedly he was thinking of that son, Oh, how happy should I be were my son to enjoy this massive wealth. Meanwhile, Lord, the poor man in search of food and clothing was gradually approaching the house of the rich man, the owner of an abundant bullion, gold, money, corn, treasures, and granaries, and the father of the poor man happened to sit at the door of his house, surrounded and waited upon by a great crowd of Brahmins, Kshatriyas, Vaisyas, <laughs> and Sudras. He was sitting on a magnificent throne with a footstool decorated with gold and silver, while dealing with hundred thousands of kotas of gold pieces and fanned with uh, a chori, not sure what that is, on a spot under an extended awning inlaid with pearls and flowers and adorned with hanging garlands of jewels, sitting, in short, in great pomp. The poor man, Lord, saw his own father in such pomp, sitting at the door of the house, surrounded with great crowd of people and doing a householder's business. The poor man, frightened, terrified, alarmed, seized with a feeling of horripilation all over his body and agitated in mind, reflects thus. Unexpectedly have I here fallen in with a king or grandee. People like me have nothing to do here. Let me go. In the streets of the poor, I am likely to find food and clothing without much difficulty. Let me no longer tarry at this place lest I be taken to do forced labor or incur some other injury. So the son doesn't even recognize his own father and is actually afraid of his wealth and so forth. Thereupon, Lord, the poor man quickly departs, runs off, does not tarry from fear of a series of supposed dangers. But the rich man sitting on the throne at the door of his mansion has recognized his son at the first sight. In consequence, whereof he is content, in high spirits, charmed, delighted, filled with joy and cheerfulness, he thinks wonderful. He who is to enjoy this plenty of bullion, gold, money, and corn, treasures, and granaries has been found. He of whom I have been thinking again and again is here now that I am old, aged, 
advanced in years. At the same time, moment, and instant, Lord, he dispatches couriers to whom he says, Go, sirs, and quickly fetch me that man. The fellows thereon all run forth in full speed and overtake the poor man, who, frightened, terrified, alarmed, seized with a feeling of horripilation all over his body, agitated in mind, utters a lamentable cry of distress, screams and exclaims, I have given you no offense. But the fellows drag the poor man, however lamenting, violently with them. He, frightened, terrified, alarmed, seized with a feeling of horribulation, all over his body, and agitated in mind, thinks by himself, I fear lest I shall be punished with capital punishment. I am lost. He faints away and falls on the earth. His father, dismayed and near despondent, says to those fellows, Do not carry the man in that manner. With these words he sprinkles him with cold water without addressing him any further. For that householder knows the poor man's humble disposition, I and his own elevated position. Yet he feels that the man is his son. It's a lot of repetition, as usual. So I get the sense it's much a closer in translation, even though it uses these Western old English words like Lord. Okay. But you understand as I'm reading this, this is uh, Sugata, it's Tathagata, it's the um, uh, Shakyamuni Buddha. The householder, Lord, uh, skillfully conceals, now, now he's a Lord. You see how the word Lord just it moves all over the place. So it can confuse. There's the difference between Shakyamuni Buddha and the wealthy landowner with the elephant, blah, 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 the father. But because he has this wealth, he lords over land, he also gets the title Lord. Skillfully conceals from everyone that this is his own son. He calls one of his servants and says to him, Go, Sira, and tell that poor man, poor man, and tells him, why does it say that? Go, Sira, and tell that poor man, Go, Sira, whither thou likest, thou art free. The servant obeys, approaches the poor man, and tells him, Go, Sira, whither thou likest, thou art free. The poor man is astonished and amazed at hearing these words. He leaves that spot and wanders to the street of the poor in search of food and clothing. In order to attract him, the householder practices an able device. Now, what are we seeing here? Again, this skillful means, this, the expedient device, right? So the father, now the Lord, is going to teach his son that he is the son and deserving of this wealth, not this poor beggar that he thinks he is. But he's going to move him through this realization slowly because obviously he, he can't handle it. This is the analogy of this chapter about how the uh, once again the justification for these forty some years of teaching that have cultivated this understanding to the point where now he can say, "Okay, this is this is how to do this. This is how to apply." how to apply what you now understand so that you now can partake of the full, complete awakening in the Lotus Sutra, this teaching, the great vehicle. So this example, again, is using familial terms so you can follow along here. In order to attract him, the householder practices an able device. He employs for it two men, ill-favored and of little splendor. Go, says he, go to the man you saw in this place. Hire him in your own name for a double daily fee and order him to work here in my house. And if he asks, what work shall I do? Tell him, 
Help us in clearing the heap of dirt. The two fellows go and they seek the poor man and engage him for such work as mentioned. Thereupon the two fellows conjointly with the poor man clear the heap of dirt in the house for the daily pay they receive from the rich man, while they take up their abode in the hovel of straw in their neighborhood of the rich man's dwelling. And that rich man beholds through a window his own son clearing the heap of dirt, at which sight he is anew struck with wonder and astonishment. Then the householder descends from his mansion, lays off his wreath and ornaments, parts with his soft, clean, and gorgeous attire, puts on dirty raiment, takes the basket in his right hand, smears his body with dust, and goes to his son, whom he greets from afar, and thus addresses, Please take the baskets and without delay remove the dust. By this device he manages to speak to his own son, to have a talk with him and say, Do, Sira, remain here in my service. Do not go again to another place. I will give thee extra pay, and whatever thou wantest thou mayst confidently ask me, be it the price of a pot, a smaller pot, or a boiler, or wood, or be it the price of salt, food, or clothing. I have got an old cloak, man. If thou shouldest want it, ask me for it. I will give it. Any utensil of such sort, when thou wantest to have it, I will give thee. Be at ease, fellow. Look upon me as if I were thy father, for I am an older, for I am older and thou art younger, and thou hast rendered me such much service by clearing this heap of dirt, and as long as thou hast been in my service thou hast never shown nor art showing wickedness, crookedness, arrogance, or hypocrisy. I have discovered in thee no vice at all of such as are commonly seen in other man's servants. From henceforward thou art to me like my own son. From that time, Lord, the householder addresses the poor man by the name of son, and the latter feels in his presence of the householder as a son to his father. In this manner, Lord, the householder affected with longing for his son employs him for the clearing of the heap of dirt during twenty years, at the end of which the poor man feels quite at ease in the mansion to go in and out, though he continues taking his abode in the hovel of straw. Twenty years. Why do you think twenty years? It's, again, this is a mental exercise, right? The twenty years represents a long length of teaching from Shakyamuni Buddha taken to create security and and a feeling of belonging and a and a, and, and a feeling of place for this poor man who is his son, but he isn't ready to accept that his... Remember, India was a caste state, still is to this day. So if you have a poor caste, you never, in, in your lifetime, in any lifetime, your children's children would be in that caste. There was never any hope of climbing any kind of social ladder or economic betterment. It just, it wasn't accessible. So, in order for this poor man, who is actually the son of a hu hugely wealthy man, the disparate cast of classes, uh, he just couldn't grasp that. So, the householder, this wealthy man, dressed himself up as a, as perhaps a higher caste, but not much higher, and, and beseeched this poor man, to treat him as though he was his father. Well, this wasn't as much of a stretch for the poor man, so he gradually became comfortable with that relationship, started to own himself without really dealing with the caste idea, right? So the analogy here is with the way that Shakyamuni Buddha taught. So he gave those early students for a great number of years, opportunity through skillful means to raise their life condition 
beyond what they thought they could achieve. Once you go through enough of those steps, the idea that you can achieve more becomes inculcated into your thinking. It's no longer a matter of resisting the possibility. It becomes a matter of can do. This any challenge put in front of me, gosh, there's a real possibility I can actually achieve it. So you begin to understand now why uh, Qi Yi in the 6th century China demonstrated that Shakyamuni taught in five distinct periods. There were more than five teachings, but in those periods, the teachings brought kind of like shifting through what uh, Kandinsky would call the spiritual triangle. That from the masses, one can raise one's life condition, echo economics or not, but, but life condition in general, from uh, a lower banal uh, uh, state to a more elevated, more productive, more uh, less suffering and, and more perceptive state. All right. So that's what this story is analogizing. Skillful means. Um, after a while, Lord, the householder falls sick and feels that the time of his death is near at hand. He says to the poor man, Come hither, man. I possess abundant bullion, gold, money, and corn, treasures, and granaries. I am very sick and wish to have one upon whom to bestow my wealth. By whom it is to be received, and with whom it is to be deposited, accept it. For in the same manner as I am the owner of it, so art thou, but thou shalt not suffer anything of it to be wasted. And so, Lord, the poor man accepts the abundant bullion, gold, money, and corn, treasures, and granaries of the rich man, but for himself he is quite indifferent to it and requires nothing from it, not even so much as the price of a prasta of flour. He continues living in the same hovel of straw and considers himself as poor as before. So what's that about? What all of these great bodhisattvas are saying is that even though you bestow this great teaching, we still don't see ourselves worthy of achieving it. So although we can be in awe and amazed by it, we thank you. It's awesome. But, you know, we're just what we are. After a while, householder, after a while, Lord, the householder perceives that his son is able to save, mature, and mentally develop. Oh, isn't that what I was just talking about? Interesting that it's so literal in the actual teaching, in this translation. That in the consciousness of his nobility, he feels abashed, ashamed, dissuasted, dissuasted. Well, oh, that's an interesting word. Dissuasted. Disousted. Disousted. That's what it is. When thinking of his former poverty. The time of his death approaching, he sends for the poor man, presents him to a gathering of his relations, and before the king or king's peers, and in the presence of citizens and country people, makes the following speech. Hear, gentlemen, this is my own son, by me begotten. It is now fifty years that he has, that he disappeared from such and such a town. He is called so and so. And myself am called so-and-so. In searching after him, I have from that town come hither. He is my son. I am his father. To him I leave all my revenues, and all my personal or private wealth shall be acknowledged his own. The poor man, Lord, hearing this speech, was astonished and amazed. He thought by himself, unexpectedly, I've attained 
obtained this bullion, gold, money, and riches. Even so, O oh Lord, do we represent the sons of the Tathagatas. Now they're talking about themselves again. And the Tathagata says to us, Ye are my sons, as the householder did. We were op oppressed, O oh Lord, with three difficulties, vis-a-vis -vis the difficulty of pain, the difficulty of conceptions, the difficulty of transition or evolution. And in the world, worldly whirl, we were disposed to what is low. Follow? Then have we been prompted by the Lord to ponder on the numerous inferior laws or conditions, things that are similar to a heap of dirt. Once directed to them, we have been practicing, making efforts, and seeking for nothing but nirvana as our fee. We were content, O Lord, with the nirvana obtained, and thought to have gained much at the hands of the Tathagata because of our having applied ourselves to these laws, practiced, and made efforts. But the Lord takes no notice of us, does not mix with us, nor tell us what the, his treasure of the Tathagata's knowledge has, shall belong to us, though the Lord skillfully appoints us as heirs to this treasure of the knowledge of the Tathagata. And we, O Lord, are not impatiently longing to enjoy it, because we deem it a great gain already to receive from the Lord nirvana as our fee. We preach to the Bodhisattvas, Mahasattvas, a sublime sermon about the knowledge of the Tathagata. We explain, show, demonstrate the knowledge of the Tathagata, O Lord, without longing. For the Tathagata, by his skillfulness, knows our disposition, whereas we ourselves do not know, nor apprehend. It is for this very reason that the Lord just now tells us that we are to him as sons, and that he reminds us of being heirs to the Tathagata. For the case stands thus. We are as sons to the Tathagata, but low, or humble, of disposition. The Lord perceives the strength of our disposition and applies to us the de denomination of bodhisattvas. We are, however, charged with a double office in so far as, in presence of bodhisattvas, we are called persons of low disposition and at the same time have to rouse them to Buddha enlightenment. Knowing the strength of our disposition, the Lord has thus spoken. And in this way, O Lord, do we say, that we have obtained unexpectedly and without longing the jewel of omniscience, which we did not desire, nor seek, nor search after, nor expect, nor require, and that inasmuch as we are the sons of the Tathagata. On that occasion, the Venerable Maha Kasyapa uttered the following stanzas. We are stricken with wonder, amazement, and rapture at hearing the voice. It is the lovely voice, the leader's voice, that so unexpectedly we hear today. In a short moment, we have acquired a great heap of precious jewels, such as we were not thinking of nor requiring. All of us are astonished to hear it. It is like the history of a young person who, seduced by foolish people, went away from his father and wandered to another country far distant. The father was sorry to perceive that his son had run away and in sorrow roamed the country in all directions no less than fifty years. In search of his son, he came to some great city where he built a house and dwelt, blessed with all that can gratify the five senses. He had built plenty of bullion, gold, money, blah, 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 blah. So he repeats the story. So I'm not going to repeat the whole thing for you. I'll just end the last few stanzas because that's the end of this uh, chapter. And then I'll talk about it a little bit. One may be assiduous in giving medicines of various kinds to the sick in honor of the Sugata. One may spend alms during uh, as many eons as there are grains of sand in the Ganges. Even then, one will not be able to offer resistance of sublime nature, unequaled power, miraculous might, firm in strength of patience, is the Buddha.
A great ruler is the Jina, the Buddha, free from imperfections. The ignorant cannot bear or understand such things as these. Always returning, he preaches the law to those whose course of life is conditioned. He, the Lord of the law, the Lord of all the world, the great Lord, the chief among the leaders of the world. Fully aware of the circumstances or places of all beings, he indicates their duties so multifariously, multifarious, and considering the variety of their dispositions, he inculcates the law with thousands of arguments. He, the Tathagata, who is fully aware of the course of all beings and individuals, preaches a multifarious law, various law, while pointing to his superior enlightenment. So, fourth chapter. It's about our dispositions. Our dispositions in regard to the way we consider ourselves, our own lives, our own merit, our own worth. All these English words, all these words to try to describe what our inner monkeys are telling us. Right? In one word, ego. You know, we think of ego as being pride, but that's not right. Ego is the complex, entire complexity of our, how we see out, our worldview, and how we perceive in our self-consciousness. Everything we see out is an absolute reflection of how we see in. So if we see in a being of whatever limitation, then the world we see, we impose that limitation on. So this chapter, far different than faith, is about understanding, that part of the title I'll accept, understanding that our limitations as human beings, samsarically conditioned, are our own. That this, the, the great gift of this teaching is to blast apart those limitations wherever they lie and believe me although as and we do this naturally as we grow older because we grow more perceptive of how we get in our own way now getting out of our own way that's a different problem a different situation but we always recognize especially from our teen years when we start to assert who we think we are and then in our 20s and 30s make a tremendous amount of adjustments to the degree that we care to or believe we should. Um, Buddhism is all about taking this thing apart, this self-conception apart, so that we can remove those limitations. And as these people who've been practicing for some 40 years are now admitting to Shakyamuni, holy crap, we've been this all along. We've been you all along. We've been, you know, the son-father thing isn't about uh, uh, biological reality. It's about being of the same mind. Oh, we've been Buddhas all along. We didn't think that was accessible. We, we could teach it. We could teach others, remember in the story? We could teach other bodhisattvas how to pursue being Buddha. But it never occurred to us. Oh, oh, we're Buddha. Oh, that's what this chapter is about. And why is it about talking about it in this way? Because if you change your mind about what is accessible to you, you suddenly realize it. That should be your disposition. When you chant, when you stare at this Gohanzan, and you use it as a mental picture 
to enter your Buddha mind, you must have the conviction that the Buddha mind is yours already. What you're doing is you're pushing the sands of the Ganges out of your way. You're pushing the monkeys, the karma, that wants to say, look over here, look over here, look over here, look, yeah. I want to see clearly that all of you are just noise. And now listening to you, I'm not killing you off. I'm not, not, uh, destroying you. What I'm destroying is your influence, your obfuscation. Now I can look at the monkeys and be entertained instead of being viscerally affected and influenced by them. Do you see? This is the entire nut of getting to the Buddha mind. Now, staying there, seeing every moment of your life through that lens, that becomes the effort, the practice, the diligence. Okay? So with that, I think that was a good, I feel good about that. Um, um, again, just because I feel good about it doesn't mean anything I said made sense to you. So if you, please, please don't hesitate to make comments, ask questions, uh, you know, ask me what the heck the monkeys have to do with anything, whatever. Okay. It'll just give me an opportunity to lead you to more teachings so that you on your own, when you study, We'll go, oh yeah, this is what Sifu Sylvain was talking about. Oh yeah, I get that. Oh yeah, wasn't Buddha clever? Wasn't Shakyamuni clever? Oh, I like the way he did that. You'll start to see through the mire of words to what the intent is. And, And that's Buddhism. Intent, attitude, disposition. That's Buddhism. Not difficult really to put into words. What's difficult is to take the words and put them into action. <laughs> All right. With that, Daimoku Sancho, thank you so much for participating in this madness of a wonderful life that I want all of us to have. Nam Myo Holding Kyo Nam. Myo ho renge kyo na Myo ho renge kyo Thank you so much. Oh, I'm energized. I'm going to have a great day. <laughs> Take care. Next up, chapter five. We'll see what that one's called in the various translations. Take care. <laughs>